Let's talk about how soil forms. We'll look at climate, the organisms involved, the lay of the land, the parent material, and time. The main um, source of the material for soil comes from rocks weathering over time. And rocks are broken down by changes in temperature as well as the real extremes that may cause them to crack, etc. And then there are biological factors, plant roots poking or seeping acidic stuff on rocks, helping them dissolve, etc. And then there are the chemical factors that result from rainfall interacting with things in the soil and plants themselves. Oh, I mentioned that already, making conditions acidic. So soil can be um, compared in different parts of the world by looking at its profile and you look at a soil profile by digging a deep pit in the ground. The organic layers on the top, the O horizon, and then the ABC horizons below that and at the very bottom the bedrock which is the parent material that weathers away. Beneath the top organic layer the A horizon is that in which the organic matter particulates accumulate and salts are leached. Then the, in the diagram on the left, more detailed, you can see soil scientists divide each layer into subunits, A1, A2, A3, etc. In the B layer, you have the accumulation of materials lost from the A horizon and the B layer often has very bright orange or unusual colors. The C layer is the more sandy layer, often lighter in color, in which little particles and small rocks accumulate. So a good soil profile will have a scale to tell you how deep these layers occur. And you can see that in the topmost layers, there are roots interacting with soil, especially the picture on the right. But the action of weathering and rain over time takes the materials down from the organic top layer to the more brightly colored B layer through the A layer. And then the bottom layer, lighter in color, is the C layer. The texture of soil is really important in determining how well it holds onto water. And we'll talk a little bit now about the structure of soil. Soils differ in how much humus or um, disintegrated living material they have in them. And the amount of these things, the water holding capacity, it especially affects the ability of the soil to hold on to positively charged cations. Texture is determined by the proportion of particles of different sizes. The largest particles of all are sand, greater than 0.05 millimeters in diameter. Silt is intermediate, and clay is made of, clay particles are fine, smaller than 0.002 millimeters in diameter. So the small particles of clay have a lot of surface area and they are the best at holding on to water. So a clay soil can get wet and stay wet much longer than a sandy soil. Clay, too much clay in a soil can be a problem because accumulating at the bottom of um, a shallow area it can be a barrier to drainage and it sometimes can lead to anoxic conditions. Cation exchange capacity is affected by the pH of the soil 
and the solution, the ions in solution are in equilibrium with the nutrients absorbed or held on to by the soil particles. The ions are removed by the plants, the solute concentrations in the soil is lowered, and this means more can be released from places in the soil that are holding these cations. In certain climates, if it rains too much, the soil will lose um, ions and that will change its pH. So how soil ages differs depending on the climate and it, the part of the soil that weathers is the clay, the smallest particles. In the tropics, soils are lateritic. That means that the nutrients leach out and the reddish minerals remain in the older soils. Whereas in temperate areas, soils are podosols, where clay breaks down, leaving the top horizons white and very nutrient poor, so that in the middle of um, terrestrial environments, you can have lots of what looks like fi very fine sand, but really it's so fine it's clay. This diagram from our book shows the distribution of some of the major biomes around the continents of the Earth. And you will be doing group projects, which we'll talk about in class. The biome concept just means that similar climates in disparate parts of the world lead to quite similar looking communities, even though there are different taxa present, biomes are categories that group communities by the dominant forms of plant life, since plants are the basis for what else is in the community. In different communities of similar climates, we often see convergence, where very different um, plants from very different families, not related at all, come to look like each other. One example of this is the euphorbs, common in old world deserts, that end up looking very much like cacti. On the left here is a cactus, on the right a euphorb. The distribution of biomes corresponds to the major climate zones. In one climate zone, you can have a number of biomes depending on elevation and exposure, etc. There are a number of different classifications of biomes. Some are with finer divisions, and you know, on a local scale, we can really appreciate the importance of this. This table shows the biomes, some of the major ones by name, the climate zone that they're in, and the typical kind of vegetation you might find in them. Let's look at a couple of examples. The tropical rainforest, which is toward the equator in places very moist, lots of water, and relatively constant temperature and most of the vegetation is evergreen or with very long-lived leaves. We can contrast that with desert, the third one down, with highly seasonal climate, rain maybe less than a week of the year or every few years, and the vegetation is um, 
desert vegetation, how descriptive that is. It means it doesn't have many leaves and succulent plants, etc. I find this Whitaker life zone biome chart very informative. If you look at the x-axis, it goes from higher to lower temperatures and the precipitation from on the y-axis from low to high precipitation each biome occupies a zone on this chart with tropical rainforests the warmest to the left and the highest amount of rainfall tundra is the coldest and the driest well maybe the deserts are even drier. A neat way to compare different places on Earth is using climate diagrams or the Walter climograms where you can plot over the months of the year precipitation and temperature and see how they vary over the course of the year. So you can see here on the left, Salt Lake City, a pretty high elevation northern place in Utah, kind of a dry place, annual precipitation, the blue line between 10 and 20. Oh, wait a minute. On the left in Utah, kind of northern, dry, cool, the annual Precipitation is only 300 millimeters a year, 300 something, and the temperature average 11 degrees centigrade. But this is warmer than the other two places we're looking at here, Stockholm and Baker Lake in Canada. So this is comparing on the left, temperate grassland in the middle, boreal forest, and on the right, tundra. And here are some tropical places, Brazil, Zimbabwe, and Australia, where the precipitation is much, much higher through most of the year, and then lower in the dry season. Oh, on the left is tropical seasonal forest, so a pronounced wet season and then a dry season, but fairly constant temperature, the yellow line through the year. I just want to show you a few pictures illustrating some of the biomes. Let's look at the temperate seasonal forest. An example would be in Omaha, Nebraska. And you can see that it's distributed not only in the northern, eastern part of, of the um, North America, but Northern Europe and also over by Japan. So in this life zone, the summers are warmer and wetter. The winter months are cooler and drier. You can see that the plants of these forests are adapted to freezing conditions in the winter when they become leafless. And I love the picture on the left. The, these forests look beautiful in the fall when the leaves change colors. Let's contrast this with the tropical rainforest. You can see it on all the continents here between uh, the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn. So here's the chart for Andagoya, Colombia. Temperature, the yellow line, very constant and precipitation very high annual precipitation of over six meters of rain we'll try not to neglect the aquatic habitats and I wanted to show you a picture of a lake which has different zones described by different words the benthic zone the deepest where there are bottom sediments, the limnetic zone, open water where fish and other animals swim freely, and then the littoral zone, sort of 
at the edge of the body of water. We use this these terms too in oceans. Well, I guess in oceans there's even more terminology because they can be very deep and you can see that there's the aphotic zone where not enough light for photosynthesis penetrates the photic zone toward the top of the ocean. The word literal occurs here, but the neuritic is that that's on, only to about 200 meters deep, but since the surface of the earth is sculpted in some places, gouged out, some of the ocean floors are very deep. And let's end with this picture of cloud forests, which are moister than a dry forest, and many of the trees keep their leaves, but there are some trees that lose their leaves in the drier season, as shown in this picture on the left from Panama. But the lush forest on the right is the cloud forests in Jamaica, which stay very green all year.